It's now my pleasure to introduce Matina Kalkunis Rupel, Dean of the Faculty of Science. Thank you, Connie, and thanks to each one of you for joining us for this month's Science Connects webinar. I've really been looking forward um, to connecting with all of you today, and um, Connie is exactly right. It's a gorgeous day here um, in Edmonton, and I'm looking across the quad, and it's so beautiful. Um, I want to give you some updates before we get started on today's talk. And um, many of you probably know this, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you what the most exciting update um, is for the University of Alberta and for science. Uh, and that was an announcement that came yesterday that um, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine went to one of our uh, faculty members here at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, um, Dr. Michael Houghton, for his work on discovering the hepatitis C virus. And um, he is a uh, Canada Excellence Research Chair um, who is at the uh, Li Ka Shing Institute for Virology. Um, he's actually one of our um, researchers who's doing COVID-19 work right now, um, but he really changed the world with his discovery, uh, with he and his colleagues and their discovery of the hepatitis C virus, and they're now working on um, vaccines. So yesterday was an absolutely great day for science, uh, for science in Edmonton at the University of Alberta, um, in Alberta, and in Canada. So I um, hope that all of you um, cel celebrate um, with me and um, congratulate and thank him for um, his work and, and of course um, congratulate him on this, um, this great honor. So that's the, the most exciting update, but I wanna tell you about other things too. So um, we had a recent announcement of um, what our semester will be like in the winter. So we will continue with a combination of online delivery and in-person um, in, in, in person instruction, um, especially for some of the labs in science, um, but we'll also keep um, students um, learning remotely um, where that is um, feasible and where that um, will work well for them. So the university is also undergoing um, sort of a massive transformation called the University of Alberta for Tomorrow. Um, some of you may be aware of that, but I wanna make sure that um, you engage with that. Uh, and there is a University of Alberta for Tomorrow website where you can read about um, more information. And this is um, an initiative that is being led by our new president, President Bill Flanagan. Uh, and, and there is lots of information there. So please um, look that up, the University of Alberta for tomorrow. Also, we had a wonderful alumni um, week. We, we did something different because um, we're, of course, uh, many of us are working remotely. Uh, if you were not able to join us for any of the uh, online events, it was called the sort of campus to couch edition of Alumni Week. You can still um, participate in lots of activities that we have um, for you and that we had prepared especially for that event and we will continue to use those activities. So one of the most um, really gratifying and exciting um, activities that was put together was virtual tours of all of our labs or many of our labs and um, almost all of our collections in the Faculty of Science. So you can look at those tours. Uh, we have um, video greetings from all of the department chairs. And of course, we have um, stories that um, highlight everything that we're doing both on campus and beyond. And there are also um, many courses, uh, many massive um, online open courses that are developed for lifelong learners that I know um, include those of you that are with us, but also for um, school age children, if that's interesting for you. So all of that is available um, through the Faculty of Science website. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. Our speaker is Chris Hurd. Chris is a geologist who studies the planets and moons of the solar systems as understood mainly through meteorites. 
he's a curator of the University of Alberta Meteorite Collection. And um, we talked about that collection when we were asking some of the questions. Um, but this is an uh, internationally recognized um, collection, and he's an internationally recognized expert in meteorites from Mars. He's a member of the science team for NASA Mars 2020 uh, Perseverance rover mission. And Krista's role on that mission is as a specialist in the, in the analysis of return samples. Um, in this role, Chris will be involved in helping to choose the rocks that will one day be returned to Earth. So I'm so excited for this presentation and um, I hope that you um, join me in welcoming Chris. So Chris, take it away. Thank you, Mutina. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, I'm excited to share this, uh, this uh, experience uh, with you with, about this really exciting mission that I'm involved, involved in that's uh, set to land on Mars early next year. Uh, so yeah, here we are. Here is an artist's um, uh, interpretation or uh, take on the rover sitting on Mars. Um, and my my goal today is to give you kind of a, a brief rundown about what the rover does, and the, but to give you a sense of the overall significance of this, because as Mutina mentioned, this is the first step in bringing samples back from Mars for the very first time. So let's talk a bit about what we know and how we know what we know about Mars. Um, the, the general theme of Mars exploration over the past 20 or so years has been to follow the water. And there have been a number of significant discoveries. The joke is that water is discovered on Mars just about once every year or so. Um, but the, the fact is that we know that water is there. And uh, from a series of missions, um, some of them are still going. I'll, I'll mention the Curiosity rover here that has been going since 2011. Uh, the InSight mission, there's actually Canadian participation in that one from uh, from UBC uh, on, on this mission that's there now. Um, the ExoMars rover, unfortunately, has been delayed in its, its landing, but we now uh, have this rover that I'll talk about today, uh, as well as other past missions, including the Scout mission that had Canadian participation, including my co colleague, Carlos Lang. Hi, Carlos, uh, from uh, over in uh, engineering. Uh, and then we've had a series of orbiting missions that have provided a wealth of information about the red planet. So that provides us the context. And now we know that there's plenty of evidence that water flowed on Mars in the past. And it may have even looked something like what you see in the left-hand panel here. But that, that view of Mars comes from rocks that are at least three billion, maybe three and a half to four billion years old. We know it was wet and what we call habitable. In other words, if life as we know it was there, it probably would have survived, maybe even thrived. Uh, but today, Mars is essentially a cold desert. Uh, the temperatures rarely get above zero degrees Celsius. It has a thin atmosphere, uh, and the surface is extremely dry. Um, this is what I hope, this I think is probably the most sort of technical slide that I have, but I want to use it to set the scene, because this is a, a snapshot of what we understand that sort of captures a, the big picture question about Mars. Along the top, you see the names of the epochs that we have for the way we divide up time on Mars. Just we've done the same thing for the Earth, and now we, we've done this for Mars. Um, uh, the, the time frame known uh, as the Noachian uh, and the pre-Noachian before it essentially go from when Mars formed four and a half billion years ago, same time as the rest of the solar system, including the Earth and goes till about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago. This is time in billion years along here. Then we have the Hesperian and the Amazonian. And in this time frame, we have there's a few things that are listed here. We have lots of impacts, lots of, of debris in the solar system flying around and hitting the surface. Uh, we had, uh, starting around the Noachian, we had actual, there's evidence of valleys with rivers flowing through them, uh, especially in this era, uh, with a few sort of hints later on. But the most significant thing, and then volcanic activity was significant in Noachian, and that kind of dwindled off, although there has been recent uh, volcanic activity as well. But the key thing that I want to show here is along the bottom, and that is to say that the waters at the surface in the Noachian to pre-Noachian were a nice neutral pH, right? Not too acidic, 
not too basic. A nice neutral pH, and we know this from looking at the minerals that we can see from mostly from orbit in rocks that we infer to be that age, and they are full of clays, and clays form in that type of, of a water environment. However, right around this 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago uh, time frame, the waters shifted to being more acidic, and the, the minerals that formed as a result of that water were more dominated by what are called sulfate minerals. Um, and then after that, we had a significant drying out. And probably from, we, again, these time frames are not very well known, uh, but for, starting from about 3 billion years ago until the present day, we had a very a cold desert at the surface. And essentially, the red that you see, the red that we see at the surface of Mars is from dried out rust. So Mars has been rusting for 3 billion years. Uh, and we can see that actually. Um, this is a, an image that my, my friend Murray took. Uh, through his telescope a few days ago. And you know what, we didn't plan it this way, but you know, th today, today I think marks about 10 days when Mars is at its closest to the Earth since 2003 and, and will be until about 2035. So um, good on us for the timing on this. But that red that you see, even with the naked eye, the red, that you, the reflection that you see is from all of these rust ferric oxides that have been at the surface of Mars. But the, the biggest question, one of the biggest questions, if not the biggest question in planetary geology is why did Mars go through this transition? Because not only did it go from neutral pH to acidic to drying out, but it also lost its atmosphere. It lost its magnetosphere, its magnetic field, the, the internal dynamo, the thing in the interior that was generating a magnetic field died off around this time. And so all of these things seem to come together. But the fact is that prior to this, Mars was probably habitable. So the question then becomes, we want to answer, did Mars ever have life? And our rover is really well equipped for this. So our rover has these four main goals. The first is geology, yay geology, uh, to understand the, the rocks that were laid down on our landing site. The second objective though is astrobiology. And it's fair to say that Prior to this, NASA in particular has had the mantra of follow the water. We're going to look for water, find the water and the environments where life could have existed. However, the big difference here is that this mission is an astrobiology mission. We are actually not only going to go and look for the environment, we're going to look for the evidence of life having been there. And part and parcel of that is actually to collect samples and carefully collect and preserve those samples and leave them on the surface in a cache for eventual return to Earth. And then the fourth component is, is to prepare for human exploration of Mars, which I'll, I'll come back to as I go through the, the, uh, the equipment on board this mission. So the timeline was, of course, uh, we selected the landing site back in November 2018. I'll talk about that in a minute. The rover's been, been designed and built. Uh, it was launched at just before um, 8 a.m. Eastern time, which is fairly early for us here, uh, on July 30th. And I'll show you a, a picture that was taken by a fellow named John Krauss from a Cessna about 5,000 feet over Cocoa Beach just a few seconds after launch. And there is the spacecraft heading off towards Mars from Cape Canaveral. And it was just, it was phenomenal to, to watch if you saw it. Um, certainly for someone like me who was, who was directly involved and you could say has some things riding on it, it was phenomenal. It was absolutely thrilling. And as of today, you could check this out at this website, the total distance traveled is 184 million kilometers out of a total distance of 471 million kilometers. And its velocity relative to the Earth is over 25,000 kilometers per hour. Um, the one-way light time, that's the time it takes for a signal from the Earth to get to the spacecraft is about a minute and a half. That will extend to at least four minutes, could be longer depending on where Mars is, Mars and the spacecraft are um, throughout the mission. And then, of course, we're looking forward to landing on Mars on February 18th of next year. The landing site that we chose is Jezero Crater, and this is um, home to an ancient delta. Maybe some of you, I saw somebody coming, coming in from Houston uh, who knows what a delta is. Uh, they tend to be a good place to look for oil and gas, for example, if they're preserved in the ancient rock record. Uh, but deltas are, and look at this, I mean, this is spectacular. This is the edge of this crater Jezero. And our understanding from the amount of craters on the surface uh, of the different uh, of units here is that this, 
delta was in existence about three and a half billion years ago. And so we can get at rocks that are ancient, uh, but preserve, obviously preserve evidence of ancient water. Just to give you a sense of context, this is a map of Mars where the red, the warm colors are higher elevations and the cooler colors are lower elevations. And you have the, what are called the Southern Highlands here, which are heavily cratered. Here's the Tharsis uh, uplift with Olympus Mons and the Tharsis Montes here. Here's Olympi Elysium Mons over here. Uh, and then we have uh, these, the Northern Lowlands and on the edge of the Highlands Lowlands boundary is uh, our landing site, which is actually sits on the edge of what's called the Isidus impact basin. So it's a fairly, it's a fairly large impact basin that occurred about 3.9 billion years ago. And Jezero Crater sits on the edge of that. And uh, you can see from this that it had water flowing into it and out of it. This is about 45 kilometers across this, this crater. And look at this channel, it's absolutely beautiful. And that's the inlet channel. So this was a river some three and a half, four billion years ago that was carrying water in and filling up this crater, maybe as deep as a couple hundred meters. And as the water came in and slowed down, it dumped its load of sediment and spread it out in what's called a delta beneath the, beneath the surface. At some point, the water got high enough to, to overtop the edge, and so the water flowed out. Um, this, this ellipse here is our landing ellipse. This is where we know we can put the rover down. So we're going to land right near the edge of this. Um, and the beauty of this is that it's so well preserved. Um, we also have signatures. Uh, I, I mean, I'll just go back here because there's there are channels here that you can see. You can see, in other words, you can see evidence where water flowed cut through the other sediments within the delta. Um, and then we also have signatures from orbit that tell us that there are clays. This smectite is a type of clay in the blue here, all throughout this area. We have olivine, one of my favorite minerals, because it tends to be associated with igneous rocks. It's present in the floor here, and we're not exactly sure what the floor is covered with, but it could be some kind of igneous rock. And then carbonate, and carbonate is like limestone, that sort of thing, uh, but in this case, the magnesium rich version. Uh, it is relatively rare on Mars. Uh, and this is one of the big questions is why is there so little carbonate? Where did the sort of the carbon from, the, from a maybe thicker atmosphere go in the past? But along the margin in particular over here, we have carbonate. Um, and that's really intriguing because if these are associated with life, for example, then they would be sitting in a pretty prime spot near the edge of this 45 kilometer diameter lake um, three and a half, four billion years ago. And river deltas, and of course, lakes are habitable environments. Here's an example from Alaska that sort of gives you a, a, a picture of what could have been there minus the, the trees here. Um, and, what, and then the question becomes, what should we look for? Well, we're not looking for our classic fossils like fish or uh, or, or tree leaves or that sort of thing. We're looking for microbial biosignatures. And a biosignature is something that tells you that life was there. We're looking for evidence of, of microbial life. Um, and here's an example from Western Australia that is what's known as a stromatolite. And these layers that you see here and the geometry of these layers as they kind of go into these mounds is the result of microbes living at the very surface of the sediment, the loose sediment, in the, a zone close to, within the water where the sun is shining. And then as more sediment comes in, these microbes will work their way up higher and higher and build up these layers. And this is, a, these are, are known from the earth up to 3.6 billion years. So the right time frame. So the idea is that if Mars had enough time to evolve microbial life, then they should be preserved in the rocks that we're going to investigate uh, at Jezero by analogy with what we know from the earth. So let's talk about the rover and how we're going to do this. Uh, this is the Mars Science Laboratory, also known as Curiosity. It's been going since 2011. Uh, you can see they look very similar. Our rover is similar with a few differences. In particular, we have more cameras, and most of them are in color. So take that. Uh, and then the turret holds heavier science tools. We'll talk about that. And then the key thing is the sample caching system, where we're going to collect rock cores drilled by the robotic arm. Now, 23 cameras uh, is a lot, um, but some of them are hazard cameras. So basically sort of help us see uh, hazards in front. And this rover is incredibly well equipped. I mean, it, it, can, it can drive, it can, we can tell it to drive a certain distance and it'll go on its own, all right? We were just practicing this yesterday, in fact. 
in what's called an operational readiness test. We're setting the rover up, you know, in a simulated sense to drive 125 meters on its own, looking for hazards and going around them. Lots of cameras, including science cameras that I'll talk about, but there's also entry, descent, and landing cameras. This is really exciting because um, uh, some of these cameras are gonna record the landing. This is known as the seven minutes of terror when the, when the lander comes in. So it comes in, it slows down with a parachute first, a back shell gets ejected, and then this, this rocket-based sort of crane assembly starts firing and the tether lowers the rover down. And then when it gets close enough, the wheels come down and it sets it nicely, sets the rover nice, nicely down on the surface and then this flies away. Okay, but we don't have any control over that because of the time it takes to send commands to Mars. It's all automated, um, but we're gonna have high definition video and sound that will record this landing that we'll be able to play back later. It also has a camera, of course, importantly to on the arm to look at uh, rocks close up, like a hand lens that we have in geology, uh, very important. Our rover really is a robotic geologist slash, astro slash astrobiologist. Um, it also is able to listen, like I said, and there's another microphone here I'll talk about in a second. Um, and it has this, it has this ability to, to uh, study things up close. This is a, a little uh, video during the preparation when they're testing things out, you can see it's in a clean environment where all these engineers are have all of their uh, bunny suits on and they're watching to make sure that their rover is doing what it's supposed to do before it gets all bundled up. This is before it actually get, got bundled up and got shook like crazy to simulate launch. Um, and then it has the ability on the mast, even as we're driving around to look for signatures of minerals far away in stereo using this MassCam Z, we like to call it MassCam Z just to get the Americans going. MassCam Z uh, with this pair of eyes as well, not just looking in color, but also in, in the infrared to look for signatures of minerals. And then SuperCam, this is the coolest. SuperCam is actually a laser that can shoot the rocks up to seven meters away. And as the rock gets vaporized, there's a telescope on here that can see what the rock is made of. It looks at the light coming from that vaporized spot, smaller than a pencil point, and can tell you what that's made out of. And then the other, that other microphone I mentioned, it will actually be able to hear the rock getting zapped. All right, and then like SuperCam, then we have these things on the arm, Sherlock, Pixel, and Watson, and these are meant to look and interrogate the rocks up close. Um, and this is the type of thing that we're gonna to try to find, right? So this, here's an example of a, of a stromatolite from Western Australia. This is about the scale that we'll, we would see with a Watson imager in color. Um, and then Sherlock will be able to tell, look for signatures of different types of minerals and Pix will be able to look at signatures of different elements. So we'll have a very good idea of whether we're looking at something that even has organics in it and then this is a precursor to actually sampling uh, something that we think could be a, a stromatolite and setting it up to be brought home later. It can also look beneath the surface. Uh, RIMFAX is the first in-situ radar to see geologic features under the surface. So we can extend the, the, say the layering that we see at the surface into the subsurface. It also has a weather station. It can tell us lots of things about, about uh, wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity, even dust particles in the atmosphere. And then it also has, and this is the part that prepares for human exploration, it has a new tool that will convert carbon dioxide in Mars's atmosphere to oxygen. And it essentially breathes like a tree. And this is the type of thing where if you scaled it up some, I think 20 times, it's the type of thing you might send to Mars to sit there and generate oxygen for months or years before humans arrive. Uh, in order to supply them with, with instead of having to bring it all with you from the earth to supply oxygen for breathing and for, for fuel. Okay, and then the heart of this, and this is really what sets this mission apart, is a sample caching system. So this is an incredible piece of engineering that will allow us to, after we've interrogated our rocks and we've decided, okay, we wanna sample something, it will put these things down, it will actually core out, it takes a bit from inside, uses that to core out a rock. It goes into a sleeve, 
the sleeve, the sample goes back into the belly of the rover to get examined, make sure we got something, and then the, a cap gets sealed on it, and then it can be stored in the belly, or it can actually be put on the surface, cached on the surface for eventual return to Earth by a future mission. And this is, this is uh, if depending on the size of your screen, this might be, uh, on my screen, it's about life size. So this is a centimeter here. And this is what one of those core, core tubes would look like, uh, does look like. And we have something like 40, 45, I think, on board um, that we can use. And it will core directly into the sleeve. And then we'll get 15 to 10 to 15 grams, depending on the density of, of rock in each one. Um, and the idea is that we would land, we'd go to say a region of interest, and I'll show you some of those in a second, we're already sort of figuring out where we wanna go. We would sample some, we'd collect some of these samples and we put them in a cache. And then we would go off maybe to another area and then bring them, bring them back, or we would produce a second cache further along in our, uh, in our mission. The exact, how we're gonna do that exactly is not completely worked out. But the point is that we would cache that. And right now what we're doing, this, is a, this was presented a couple of years ago, just as a sort of a off the cuff sort of plan, depending on where we land within the ellipse, what we would look for and where we might sample shown by the arrows, okay? But the idea is that we land in this ellipse, we look at the delta, we go up on the delta probably, and we make our way to the marginal uh, deposits, the carbonates, and then we go to the rim and then beyond. Uh, but in fact, we're redoing that process now in a rigorous way. We are now subdivided in our team. Our team is over 300 scientists, by the way, involved in this in different capacities. Um, and we're divided up into subgroups, one looking at the crater floor, one looking at the delta, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially looking at every bit of information that we have about each area and coming up with the top priority targets uh, for that particular area. So for the crater floor, here are the rock units that we can see from orbit that we want to try to get at and, and planning that out. And then the next phase is going to be kind of putting those together, those efforts together to say, okay, here's the traverse that we want to take, right? If any of the geologists on, online here know, you have to plan out your traverse ahead of time. So that's essentially what we're doing in as rigorous a way as possible so we have a plan. If we end up further out, further east in this, in this ellipse, then we'll probably investigate some of these remnants of the delta deposits before we head in this way, right? Um, but essentially, we're gonna to try to integrate all that into some nominal traverses. And not only do we do that, we're also going to integrate the minimum of 20 samples that we want to collect by the time what, what's called the nominal mission is done. By the end of the nominal mission, which is one and a half Mars years or three Earth years, we hope to be toward the rim of the crater or outside of Jezero crater with at least 20 samples. And these 20 samples are not just all the same. These are a diverse set of samples, as you can see here, um, and that are going to be so compelling, we hope, that's, that's kind of the challenge for us, they're gonna be so compelling that we, have, we could do nothing better than to actually spend the additional money to bring those samples home. Um, and that's effectively, the role that I've been asked to play. And this was a, a press release by NASA. We had co uh, coordination with the U of A and Canadian Space Agency, which provides support for me to participate um, uh, back in February of this year, talking about the addition of 10 of us who competed for positions as return sample scientists. And these were, this was a call put out a couple years ago now, and we applied through the NASA system. There are some 50 some people who applied and 10 of us got uh, selected for, for this role. Um, since then, another five have been added uh, from the European Space Agency with European Space Agency support. And so there's 15 of us whose goal, who, we join this group of 300 uh, plus scientists, uh, but with a specific expertise. Um, and it's really an honor to be a part of this. In fact, I, the, I'm listed here along with my colleague, Tanya, Bosak from MIT, because we are the two representatives of this group of return sample scientists, scientists on the project science group. This is the, this is the leadership council for the entire mission, um, which is just, it's absolutely thrilling because we are the ones that are gonna be essentially guiding this mission ultimately. The, the team works together, but when the decisions have to be made, that's gonna be us. Um, and so if you had told 13 uh, year old Chris right here, uh, who already had decided at that age that he wanted to work on Mars samples when they came back, I think he'd be a pretty excited kid. 
Okay, now one thing, uh, as Martina mentioned in my uh, intro, is that I've been working on Martian meteorites. And the reason is because that 13-year-old kid wanted to work on Mars rocks. And so this is the next best thing until we bring samples back. And so we already have 140 rocks from Mars. Okay, so you go, well, why do we need to go and collect these 20 to 35 samples? So here's the intriguing thing. Um, and the important thing to note, these rocks are all igneous rocks. Um, they don't have, they're not layered with slime on them, like green slime on them, like as shown in this artist impression. This is, this is a, a great image though by Don Davis, friend of mine. But uh, the, the idea though with how these meteorites got to earth is that another impact occurred on Mars and rocks near the point of impact got lofted off of Mars and accelerated fast enough to leave Mars gravity. And then they go around the sun and then Fortunately, they cross the orbit of the Earth and fall to the Earth as meteorites. And the outside gets a fusion crust on it. This is classic fusion crust. They've been found all over the, the Earth, including in Antarctica. This is a famous one that was collected in 1979. Um, the gray here is the igneous interior, and then the black is this, this eggshell-like fusion crust, but it's an igneous rock. Um, we don't know exactly where they're from on the surface of Mars, although I have a research effort sort of looking into that. That's a talk for another day. And they're almost all much less than 3.6 billion. In fact, the vast majority, some 80% of all of these rocks from Mars are uh, less than a billion years old. And the reason for that is because this is a very violent process and it makes a bias in the sampling towards the rocks that are the strongest that are gonna make the trip or gonna survive the impact. And those are the volcanic igneous rocks that dominate the meteorite collection. So the difference here is that instead of nature kind of choosing the rocks that we have, we get to go and choose the rocks that are almost certainly not going to make uh, a natural trip to, to Earth. And so then what's the plan? Well, the plan is uh, we're almost here where the sample collection by perseverance and start in about the current plans. This is a, a international plan, NASA European Space Agency, hopefully with Canadian uh, space Agency and, and Canadian industry involvement is that the in 2028 a fetch rover will uh, will meet up with this rover or or go to the place where we cache the samples and collect them up and give them put them in an orbiting sample container about the size of a basketball a little bit larger with the little slots in it. Uh, and put it on the sample retriever lander which has a rocket on board that will launch that. Uh, OS, as we call it, into orbit around Mars, well, where it will rendezvous with a Mars orbiter that will capture this and bring it back to the Earth with the idea of it coming back to Earth in 2031, which sounds like a long uh, ways away, but it's actually not that far away when you think about it. And so the key thing is by the time 2031 rolls around, we would have this suite of ideally a minimum of 20, ideally more like 35 to 40 samples, including blanks to help trace contamination, et cetera, that would be at the surface of the earth. And there'd be an international uh, agreements in place where they would all be curated in a central facility and then provided to scientists all around the world, hopefully yours truly as well. Uh, and so that's it. And there are an incredible number of resources uh, because it's NASA uh, at this website right here, uh, which I encourage you to go and check out and, um, and follow on social media. And there'll be lots to, uh, to explore Mars with as, uh, as we get closer and certainly as February uh, rolls around. Thanks. Wow. Uh, that that was really amazing, Chris. And um, I'm going to uh, moderate some questions. Um, and honestly, I want to share with you one of these questions right away. And it says, Chris, do you teach classes at the U of A? And if so, what do you teach? I bet you'd be a great teacher. And um, I, I mean, I don't I could just listen to you forever talking about this. And I honestly don't know how you have the patience to wait. That, that, that must be just, gosh, <laughs> like you must, 
I don't know how you have patience, but anyway, it's so exciting. I can't, I can't even talk about how exciting this is for me, but um, just, just because um, Rosalind asked the questions, what kind of classes do you teach and, and what are you teaching to the students at U of A? Uh, well, one of the, my, my favorite courses is actually Geology of the Solar System, which is EAS 206. And uh, that one I've taught for several years now. And it's really exciting because there's so much happening in space exploration that I have to update my notes every year. I, don't, mm -hmm. I often don't have the same slides um, uh, mm -hmm. every year as I go through it because there's so much going on all throughout the solar system and including, you know, in extrasolar planets and that type of thing as well. Um, so that I teach, um, uh, and I also teach uh, mineralogy, and I t also teach an advanced planetary geology course where we use some of the meteorites in our collection. That's a, like a fourth fourth year level course slash mm -hmm. grad course. Um, unfortunately, uh, sort of the flip side of me being involved in this mission is I don't teach as much uh, right now because I'm going to be really busy with the rover right. starting in the new year. So, yeah. uh, but I do have my postdoc who's going to be uh, 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 teaching EAS 206. So people Wonderful. should check that out if they can. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask some questions that are coming in um, from, from those that are joining us. So uh, one question is um, from Matthias. Um, will we be able to tell if there are signs of life when the rover analyzes the sample or only when they're returned? That so, is an so, excellent yes. question. That is, uh, that is probably the question. <laughs> uh, because, so this is the thing. So um, the answer is we hopefully will have some really good hints uh, when the rover is investigating the rocks. So let's say we drive up to the the toe of the delta. Um, fine grain sediments tend to capture organic matter that was in the system, in the lake or in the river uh, at the time when those sediments are deposited. Okay, so let's say we drive up to that and we see the signature of organic matter in there. Now we won't be able to tell exactly what kind of organic species are in there, but we'll have an idea of so maybe some of the components. And that would be a, a fantastic target to get. Now, let's say we drive to these marginal carbonates and all of a sudden we see layering, like I showed in my example from Western Australia. Wow, that would be fantastic, right? Because we could say that could be a stromatolite. However, the thing is that we can't definitively say that until we have a sample back in labs on the earth. So the rover, as capable as it is, can only go so far because, you know, it was Carl Sagan who said, you know, I think he said he, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. So if mm -hmm. you're going to say that life was there, that's the key difference is that in order to really say that life was there, we have to have that sample of say that potential stromatolite back in labs on the earth. So we can throw everything that we ha have at it all of those things that we've thrown at samples, say from Western Australia, that are, you know, enigmatic and and you know we have to really tease out. We have to to look at isotopes. We got to look at mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. organic signatures and all of those things collectively to say, you know what, this really did form in this type of environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's the the key thing that this rover will do. That is so different from previous missions and why we can say that it's an astrobiology mission because we can mm -hmm. we will be able to tell once those samples are back yes or no whether life was there. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we have lots of questions and I've got um, a couple that are sort of related to one another and that it's talking about the magnetic field. So um, during, did the drying period start with a poor magnetic field and could you explain the value of magnetic field to Earth? Yes, so the answer is yes, around the same time. It's not exactly clear, uh, but we know that rocks that are older than about 3.9 billion years have a magnetic signature um, mm -hmm. that was detected from orbit a few years ago. So we know there was a what they call a geodynamo, a, a magnetic field being generated from the interior. Um, and we know that the atmosphere started to thin out after that. And so the magnetic field actually, and I, this is not my, my main area of expertise, so I, you know, maybe don't quote me on all this, but, but mm -hmm. it, does, it does provide protection against the solar wind um, uh, uh, particles from, from interstellar or from, from, from space. And so when it shut down, then that protection is gone and that may have been a factor in the atmosphere getting eroded away. So there, there may be a connection between the two. Yeah. Mm. 
Okay, um, next question. How do we know that the meteorites that you were talking about from Mars are actually from Mars? Right, and um, this, is a, this is a great question. Uh, the, the meteorite that I showed you a photo of sitting in the mm -hmm. field, uh, I kind of mentioned that it's famous. That's because it's known as the Elephant Moraine 79001. So it was collected in the Elephant Moraine area of Antarctica in the 1979-80 season. Um, and it was recognized in the 70s that meteorites that fall onto the Antarctic ice sheet just get, get sort of freeze dried into the ice. Mm. And as the ice tries to push up over the Transantarctic mountains, it, the ice ablates away and leaves a lag of rocks that tend to be meteorites. Now they're not all Martian, of course, but this one was recognized as being something different. And when they looked at it, they realized it was different. And it was similar to other meteorites that were known in the world's collections, but people didn't really know where they were from. They had different characteristics. And it was that one though, that somebody looked at it and they said, you know what, if we, try to, there's little pockets in here that may have gas trapped inside. And so they analyzed that gas, extracted it from the rock, analyzed it and figured out that it, the composition matched the composition of the atmosphere of Mars, which mm -hmm. was analyzed by the Viking landers in 1976. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because Mars atmosphere is unique in the solar system, it's like a fingerprint that tells us that those are from Mars. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, again, that are related, and I want to make sure I get to as many as possible. So, um, questions from, one is from Bruce. How much would you predict could be heard and recorded in a Martian atmosphere? And then another question from Sharon, if there's no air on Mars, how will the microphones pick up sound? Okay, well, I'll answer Sharon's first. That there's actually, there is air on Mars. It's carbon dioxide dominated. It's about one one hundredth the pressure of the Earth. Um, and to answer Bruce's question, uh, we know that we can, that's enough to actually transmit sound. Um, mm -hmm. There are my colleagues at uh, Los Alamos National Labs that are in charge of the SuperCam, the, mm -hmm. the laser that's going to zap the rocks at a distance, have made uh, a Mars chamber. So you can pump it down I to see. one one hundredth and then mm -hmm. fire the laser and then they can tell that, that you can hear and they, they're characterizing it now to see it sort of see, okay, if we hit this type of rock of this hardness or whatever you in Mars atmosphere conditions, what will it sound like? Because um, that's it, there's scientific information there. It's not just coolness mm -hmm, factor. Mm -hmm. There's actually information on right. as you're hitting it from a distance, you're doing remote science. You're basically saying, I want to know what that rock is over there, its composition, but also its hardness, because mm -hmm, if it's mm -hmm. It can be difficult to tell at a distance what a rock is is on Mars, and this will actually help us with that. Okay, so um, next question is how how is the rover powered, and how do you keep the dust off of all of the camera lenses? Okay, so um, the rover is powered by what's called an RTG, so it's a radioisothermal nuclear device uh, it is uh so it's it's powered by plutonium um, and the plutonium provides generates electricity so it doesn't rely on solar panels uh, this is the same as the curiosity rover that's been going since 2011 so the idea is that yes the nominal mission is one and a half mars years but the idea is that this thing can keep going um, indefinitely it can keep making making discoveries uh, in terms of so we don't have to worry about about dust getting on any solar panels. It's a good point about the dust on the camera lenses and I actually don't know, but I know that there's some very smart engineers on the team that can, can, uh, can figure it out. Although I do know that there's, a, there's a, a cap, like a lens cap on some of the scientific cameras. So that would keep the dust off when it's not being used. Perfect. Okay, so David says, great talk. I'm wondering what depth the coring tool can go to and what depth is a typical weathering rind expected to be? Yeah, that's great. So it goes to about um, 10 centimeters or so. Okay. Um, and so well below uh, typical weathering. Weathering rinds on Mars are, are fairly thin, uh, maybe a millimeter, uh, maybe not even that. The other additional mm -hmm. thing I didn't mention though, is that it does have a, a, a core, um, an abrasion tool. Mm. So we can actually abrade the surface to remove um, a potential weathering rind, uh, either before we investigate it or before we actually take a, take a core. 
Perfect. Thanks, Chris. So I think you've already addressed this um, when you were talking about the magnetic field, but I'm just going to ask it from Donald. How He says, hey, Chris. Um, so hey from Donald. Um, <laughs> how is it that Mars, without any atmosphere to speak of and with billions of years of exposure, hasn't been eroded? Well, it still has, it still has protection against um, uh, particles uh, from the solar wind and from space. Uh, from radiation, it still ha the particles, radiation makes it to the surface. That's one of the reasons why the surface itself is inhospitable because life can't survive under those conditions. Um, but in terms of erosion of the rocks, mm -hmm. then you have to look at the actual, the ge geological features. So even with, with a weak atmosphere, there's wind erosion. We see evidence of that. We see evidence of dunes um, yeah. all over the place, in fact, sort of loose sediment getting blown around. Um, and then there's other periods of, uh, of, of either um, uh, water flowing, uh, of course, impacts uh, are a form of erosion as well. So the point is that we have uh, surfaces of different ages. You know, some of, the, some of the surfaces are definitely older, some are younger. There, there's, there's also rocks that have covered up the surface, the younger rocks, like the, like the mm -hmm, lavas mm -hmm. from Tharsis or whatever, have erupted out onto the surface. Some of those are estimated to be as young as, as 10 million years. So, so there's lots of different activity there. And, the, and the, the key thing that I was trying to get at in the sort of big picture is that we can see rocks of different ages and we can sort of infer the, the timeline for Mars from mm. that. Okay. So there's a few more questions, but I want to get to this question because I think uh, many people um, ask the questions or um, family members ask the questions. And it is, what advice do you have for aspiring geologists or even aspiring scientists that are interested, like, like the 13 year old you, what advice <laughs> would you give to him? Oh, um, I guess, yeah, that's, that's it's, it's a big question, but it's, it's a an big important question. One. <laughs> it is. And I think, I think it's the, you know, the, the thing for me that the thing that excited me was the idea. I didn't have a picture obviously of what, you know, what it would, it would mean to bring rocks back from Mars, but mm -hmm. the idea of, of kind of, what if we could study the geology of an entirely different planet? You know, what, what if we could, and, and Mars is the natural one to look at because it, it has this history that's written in the rocks. And so the question is, you know, so the, how do you, how do you do that? And then the idea for me that, that sort of crystallized for me was you could actually study rocks that come back from there. And that's what guided me. You know, when I went off to, so, so I guess the advice is, is if there's something that's really exciting to you, try to hold on to that and like, mm -hmm. see how it can, and see how it connects to the, to the universe that we're in, you know, see how it connects scientifically to other things and sort of get the context for it. And then have that as your, as your goal and long term, Matina, you said, how do I, how am I so patient? Well, 13, 13, I've been waiting since that, you know, and no, then, know. and when I was in grad school 20 years ago, they were, you know, I, they were talking about Mars sample return, you know, in five to 10 years. And so there's right. always, it's always kind of been on the horizon. Right. Um, but then it's, it's sort of, okay, what's that one thing that you, that epi sort of epitomizes what it is that, that you want yeah. to do and work toward it. And, you know, I mean, I, other things, thanks to this, fantastic place, the Faculty of Science in the U of A, with the meteorite collection and the resources available. Mm -hmm. I've taken all kinds, I've expanded all kinds of, into all kinds of research on mm -hmm. primitive meteorites, like t frozen meteorites, like Tagish Lake and other types of, of investigations. Um, but they all contribute in some way to this mm -hmm. uh, idea of what do you need to bring samples back from yeah. Mars. So that's yeah. the guiding, sort of the guiding thing. So I guess it's that, find that thing that's really exciting and use it as your guiding principle, see where it takes you. Right. Well, I'm gonna take one more question and just let people know that we'll answer these questions um, offline. So if we haven't gotten to your question, don't worry. The last um, question that I'd like to ask Chris before I wrap up is, um, what can go wrong and what are the some of i guess it's what can go wrong with the coring i mean with everything that you talked about really but but what kind of troubleshooting can the scientists do from earth while all of this is happening yeah that's that's a great question and um there there are lots of points of failure um but i i um and the 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 key for success is the 
is the engineers that are involved and they're the guides, you know, I mean, they're the ones who are going to tell us scientists not to do anything stupid or try to do anything <laughs> stupid with the, with the rover. Okay. They're going to say, you know, you, I'm, I know how much you want to reach that rock, but you can't reach that rock. So we're going to have to go somewhere mm -hmm. else. Um, but, but the, 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 the capabilities of this rover are absolutely astounding. Even the, the, the mechanisms involved in collecting the, the sample, they've been tested. That's the thing. They've been tested multiple times. Um, and they, I think we rely on previous experiences, curiosity, uh, the Mars exploration rovers, which were, which went way, way beyond their anticipated lifetimes. A lot of that is really due to the people involved that are smart and know how the rover works and can like, and can mitigate and, and find workarounds and that, that sort of thing uh, to keep us going. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm not going to go into what could go wrong. There's lots of things that could go wrong, but, but the, the point is that there are some very, very smart people right. who are involved that, uh, that are going to keep us going and we're going to yeah. get the most we possibly can out of this. I am confident about that. Well, Chris, honestly, I can't wait for some of these results. I'm, I know that you can't wait, but we are all going to look forward to following this and following your work and hearing about some of the results. I want to wrap up by um, by thanking you for taking the time to tell us about your work. And I also want to let people know about, um, so somebody asked about, you know, what do you teach and what's, what's available? I want to remind everybody that um, I mentioned some of the uh, massive online open courses that we've developed at the Faculty of Science. And um, some of them are about um, space and black holes um, that are aimed at um, um, children and, and lifelong learners. And then there's um, Space 101 that is available for school age children. So there really are some resources for those um, for all of the learners in your life, if you want to um, pursue this further. Um, thank you, Chris, so much for sharing your science with us. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I'm going to look forward to seeing you um, for our next Science Connects webinar. And that is going to be on November 19th, where Assistant Professor Adam Kashluk will be sharing how statistical methodology can be used on seemingly disparate data sets, um, but tell us a lot. So um, questions about human speech, questions about COVID-19 and um, the spread of the virus, and questions about the Alberta electorate. So um, I'll look forward to seeing you there. Please watch for the post-webinar email that will include some um, probably some follow-ups for questions that we did not get to, um, more ways to connect, opportunities for how you can support research and research programs, such as this one in the Faculty of Science, and ways that you can share your feedback with us. With that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Please take care of yourselves and stay in touch. Bye, everyone.